Now I'm very pleased to introduce Professor David Williams to present on leading practice tailings management. David is a professor of geotechnical engineering and the director of the Geotechnical Engineering Centre within the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Queensland. He's a chartered and registered professional engineer with over 40 years experience and is internationally recognised for his expertise and experience in mine waste management and mine closure. He is particularly recognised for his expertise in tailings dams and the closure and rehabilitation of tailings dams and waste rock dumps, including the design of covers. He carries out high level reviews of and provides expert advice and opinion on tailings dam designs, tailings and waste rock facility closure and the closure and rehabilitation of open pits. In 2016, he authored the Tailings Management Handbook as part of the Commonwealth Leading Practice Sustainable sustainable development program for the mining industry. He's on the working party for the Australian National Committee for Large Dams, Gu Dams Guidelines on Tailings Dams, Planning, Design, Construction, Operation and Closure, which was published in 2012. He's also commissioned to write updates. He's been retained on the expert panel to investigate the technical causes of the recent Tailings Dam failure in Brazil. Please welcome David Williams. Let's see if I can get this uh, video to go. Look, we won't, we won't run it because you've probably seen it. Who's not seen it? A few people have not seen it? Okay. Um, I'll show you on my computer later. <laughs> it won't run on the way it's set up here, but I think yeah, most people here know this, this is the failure in, uh, in Brazil that happened about two and a half months ago. So I put this in as you're all used to having safety shares, so this is a bit of a... Uh, catastrophic safety share, a moment of reflection. Over 300 people were killed. They've recovered about 200 of the bodies or 220 of the bodies. They've still got a, another 90 or so that haven't, been, that haven't been accounted for. Actually, interestingly, uh, we were on site a couple of weeks ago, a week and a half ago, and uh, they actually found uh, one of the so-called fatalities, but in fact, he wasn't at the site at all, but his family had claimed the compensation. They found him in his village. Uh, what it looked like uh, afterwards was something like this. If you watch that video, there are actually fortuitously two videos. There's a video of the front, there's a video of the back. Now, you won't have seen the one on, on the, from the back side. That wasn't released. These were mine site videos, and uh, so the cameras were set up by the mine site. They were obviously released by angry workers. Uh, they didn't release the one from the back. So if you saw just the front one, it appeared like a very deep-seated circular failure. If you saw the, the back view, in fact, it was quite a, a narrow failure, quite a shallow failure, but then it regressed and you had this almost vertical scarp that regressed and you had flow of the, the bottom of that scarp coming out. And in the end, probably 85% of the tailings came out of that dam. Let's talk about leading practice tailings management. Now, I always struggle with this word a little bit. You know, do you call it best practice, leading practice? One of the problems with any of those terms is we, what we tend to do is we tend to choose uh, the best of the conventional practice uh, not necessarily leading practice. So I think uh, leading practice is a better term than best, best practice because best implies best of conventional. But I think we need to move beyond the conventional. And there are a number of constraints, constraints that all tailings, dam, uh, tailings dams or tailings storage facilities must operate under. Actually, even the term tailings storage facility, of course it used to be called tailings dams, because we've had a lot of uh, notoriety about failures recently, I think we've gone back to calling them tailings dams because that's what actually fails rather than the storage facility. It's a bit like uh, freeways becoming a, a dirty word, so we call them motorways or arterial roads or something else. It doesn't disguise the fact that they're actually a dam. We've got to take into account the setting, the climate, the topography, the seismicity of the site. We've got to take into account the nature of the tailings. We, we usually do that up to a point, but you go to a site and how much uh, information is there actually about the, the nature of the tailings? Particle size, distribution, you might know the P80 or the D80 or something like that. You don't typically know the full particle size distribution, and that's a relatively straightforward thing to determine. We don't necessarily know a lot about the geochemistry either. The production rate, we've got to accommodate that. We need to manage the supernatant tailings water. 
we need to meet discharge water quality license conditions, which are normally no discharge. Why is that? Because the industry is not trusted. They're not trusted to discharge clean water. Therefore, thou shalt not discharge water at all. And that actually follows through into closure as well. Well, you can't close a mine if you can't ever discharge. It's, it's not going to work. It, it's, it's not possible. We need to rehabilitate the tailing storage facility on closure. We need to come up with some, uh, some method of getting to a, an agreed land use or at least an ecological function. And really the key is good water management. Good water management. We're putting the tailings out conventionally as a slurry. We've got to manage the water. Or we change the way we do it. We're not there yet. If we're going to, if we're looking at surface tailing storage facilities, we'd look at things like the dam foundation, we would look at the burrow materials, we've got to look at the settled dry density that we might achieve with our tailings. If we're going for upstream raising, we need to, to follow certain procedures. There are certain rules that should be applied to. Just to give an example, the rate of rise that is typically applied is uh, if you can get it less than one metre per year, that's good, certainly no more than two. The Samarco or Fundau Dam that, that failed a few years ago, the rate of rise was up to two to three metres per month, two to three metres per month, an order of magnitude higher than typical upstream raises elsewhere in the world. You've got to look at the, the risk of spill of water and or tailings. People, infrastructure, environment downstream are the key. If a pit fails, it fi fails within the pit. So it might close the operation, it typically doesn't, uh, well these days in developed countries, it typically doesn't kill people. Bingham Canyon failure several years ago didn't kill anyone because they monitored the, the pit walls well and the pit fell in, but they had the people uh, out of the way well in advance. Uh, with a waste rock dump or a tailing storage facility creating seepage, which might be acidic or saline, uh, you typically don't kill people. You kill fish and habitat maybe for maybe some tens of kilometres downstream you typically don't kill people. When tailing stands fail, you kill people. Not always, but often, and often large numbers of people. You also affect infrastructure and, and the environment a long way downstream. In the case of Fundau, it went all the way to the, the Atlantic, about five or 600 kilometres away. If you're going in pit, you will have a high rate of rise. With a surface tailing storage facility, it's a flat structure, at least in Australia, because we don't have the topographic relief fairly large footprint, but with a pit it's like this. So the initial rate of rise is going to be enormous. Um, and you, you will typically not fully consolidate those tailings. You'll be, your rate of rise will be too quick to allow those tailings to fully consolidate. You have difficulty removing water because you've got to try and maintain pumps down in the pit. You'd have to come down the ramp or something like that to be able to do that. And even if you could re remove water, you'd still have quite a body of water over most of the tailings you'll end up with a poor settled density, poor consolidation, no des desiccation. You have the risk of overtopping by water, maybe, if you, if you keep going eventually. But the, the key thing really is the potentially, diffi potentially difficult, potential difficulty in rehabilitating those tailings in pit. That's probably the key. Now, there's a commonly held perception supported by the net present value approach. Who doesn't know what the net present value approach is? What's a typical discount? You don't? <laughs> What's a typical discount factor? Yell it out. Six, seven. It's probably in the range six to 10%. When do you apply 10? When things are booming, because you want to get the new project up and running, you want to convince the financiers that it's financially viable. So you use 10%. At the moment, you're probably using about seven or six. A couple of years ago, maybe six, because you weren't building any new projects, so you didn't need to justify them to the financiers. That's the approach. So the net present value approach will support the idea of delaying capital expenditure. So we'll build a small tailings dam to start with. And of course, we'll fill it up very quickly because we, we have a, a, a given production rate, it'll fill very quickly. And then we have no shit moment, we build another one, another little small one, we fill it up quickly. Oh, <laughs> another one. And eventually we end up with quite a big footprint, but we've done it in stages where we've been filling them relatively quickly and our ability to cycle deposition, to take advantage of, in our climate, desiccation, uh, get a, a high dry density, uh, occupy less volume overall, is lost because we're, we're filling up small storages as we go. So there, there is this common perception that uh, transporting tailings as a slurry 
to a dam is the most economic. The cheapest way of moving, the tailings come out as the slurry anyway, it's a wet process typically, so it comes out as a wet slurry anyway. The cheapest way of transporting that is by pumping it to a storage. You just need somewhere to put it. The plant manager, you know, his responsibility is to, is to keep production up in the plant. He just wants somewhere to put the tailing slurry that is produced as, a, as an outcome. So dewatering tailings to a paste or by filtration is perceived to be too expensive, certainly by the net present value approach, because you'd have to put in a lot of capital up front to put in the plant that would either produce a paste or produce uh, filtered tailings. The reduced storage volume occupied by tailings paste or the filter cake and the relative ease of capping it are discounted by the discount factor because it's someone way off in the, the never never. Uh, as is the potential for a higher level of future land use. The cost of rehabilitating the resulting soft and wet tailings is discounted. In fact, maybe we'll never do it. Uh, how many tailings dams in New South Wales have been rehabilitated? What's, what proportion of them? I know in Queensland it's very low, it's very small. Few tailing storage facilities have in fact been rehabilitated due to the difficulty and expense of capping what is still a slurry-like tailings uh, consistency, particularly at a time when the mine no longer has revenue to fund it. Now, this is just a little uh, exercise I did. It's, a, it's based on a 20-year coal mine in relatively, relatively flat terrain because Australia has relatively flat terrain, which means we don't have a lot of free storage for tailings or waste rock for that matter. We don't have big valleys that we can fill with tailings with a small dam at the front. So we, we start with a, a moderate uh, valley. We put a, a dam across it and as we raise uh, the dam, we have to extend the dam's perimeter, then we have to extend it across saddles, and eventually we're covering most of the perimeter. When we get to the stage where the dam has encompassed most of the perimeter of, of the, uh, the storage, it's too expensive to raise, so we find another little valley, another small valley, and do the same thing again, typically. So this is this little exercise, if you like, and I've just done a, a comparison between a number of different approaches. So if you're in flat terrain, because you'll have to put a, a, a very extensive dam, which will get bigger and bigger over time, there's a high cost of the dams in flat terrain. So here we've got discount factor of 2.5%, 5%, 10%. And you can see that the more you discount it, the cheaper it looks. But what's a realistic, let's not call it a discount factor, what's a realistic CPI? It's more like 2%, isn't it, or 2.5% at the most. The mining industry sometimes when you're in boom times uh, will actually inflate at a faster rate than typical CPI. So high cost of dams in flat terrain. If you go for in pit tailing, storage, uh, tailing storages, the uh, deposition is cheap, but the rehab is going to be very expensive. If you look at a, an on-off facility, and there are a few around, um, Charbonne, New South Wales, and the, uh, the Lithgow area has, has had, a, had a, an on-off uh, tailings facility for some time, they have limited space, so they put the tailings in relatively shallow depth, allow them to desiccate and then harvest them and put them in with the coarse reject. Uh, but it's a high cost of rehandling. Pressure filtration, high capex, but the overall cost, as against building a tailings dam in flat terrain, is actually not, not that, that bad. It's a lot of upfront costs, but not that bad. Or if you had a balance, you, you started with a small surface tailing storage facility and then you went in pit. Uh, you still have some, some rehab costs to deal with. So I think we need to look more objectively at our costing, our funding model. I can understand why the mining industry would use net present value approach with a high discount factor to convince the financiers, the banks, to, to bank their, bankroll their, their projects. But the problem is it then goes into operations and the longer the operation, uh, the more problematic the net present value approach becomes. And ultimately, when you get to closure, it's totally problematic. I'll show another example later. So take an example like uh, Mount Isa. Everyone knows about Mount Isa. It's been going for almost 100 years now. So the, the exercise or the use of the net present value approach through that 100-year 100, 100 period has led to all sorts of problems now that they're now considering closure. Closure is, is now within sight. So let's look at, uh, let's start with conventional tailings disposal and storage in a dam. It varies from region to region. Upstream construction, for example, 
possibly using tailings if you can, is widely employed in South Africa. I'm not sure that it was uh, first developed there, but it was certainly practiced a lot in the uh, Johannesburg region, the, the gold mining area. It was practiced in Kalgoorlie in the early days. It's, it's spread across Australia quite widely. It's also used in the southwest of the USA. These are all dry climates where you can take advantage of desiccation. You can make upstream construction work provided your rate of rise is not too high. Down construct, downstream construction is employed in wet or seismic regions for obvious reasons. The wet tropics, uh, perhaps parts of Canada where there isn't too much upstream raising, or seismic regions around the Pacific Rim. Chile, for example. Well, actually, that's not, that's not true entirely. Chile mainly uses centerline construction these days, used to use upstream. Sand dams, sand dams, cycloned uh, or, and or compacted, are widely employed in South America, uh, usually raised by the centerline method or in some cases by the upstream method. Sand dams. Take yourself to a beach. Let's build a, a dam out of dry sand. It's fine, it'll stand up at 30 degrees. Now let's put slop behind it. What do you think will happen? If the sand dam isn't very wide, the slop will express as seepage on the downstream face of the, the sand dam, and it will take off and it'll become a beach. Isn't that essentially what happened with Thundau? Maybe it's what happened with the most recent one as well. Maybe it's some, something slightly different. But sand dams, in South America, there's this predominance of sand dams. Chile uses them, Brazil uses them, Peru uses them. They build tailings dams out of sand. Uh, why? Because it's the cheapest material available. It's actually the sand fraction out of the tailings. It's either achieved by cycloning or it's achieved by separating the two streams in the, in the plant. It's the cheapest construction material available. That's why they do it. Roller compacted concrete dams uh, are favoured in areas of very high uh, topographic relief, so parts of the Andes, um, the uh, Antamina Dam, for example. So the while the necessity for downstream construction is understandable in wet or seismic regions, the choice between an upstream construction and sand dams is not so obvious. Perhaps it's more a function of what we've always done. Why do you keep doing that? Because we've always done it that way. Let's look at uh, the tailings continuum. This was taken from Davies and, and Rice originally, but I've modified it a little bit. And don't worry about all the, all the words in this diagram. I just want to highlight a couple of things. <clears throat> so we've got, at the top of that diagram, we've got slurry-like consistency. At the bottom of the diagram, we've got soil-like consistency. So I trained as a civil engineer. I focused on soil mechanics. I deal with soil-like consistency, but um, over the, my career, I've dealt more and more with slurry-like. So I, I like to think I actually go from slurry-like materials through soil-like materials right through to about weathered rock. That's, that's my range, my geotechnical range. So you've got uh, tailing slurry. Now, if you've got clay mineral rich tailings, which is typical of some coal seams that are washed, you won't get much better. It will, it will be difficult for you to get beyond a slurry. It, it won't, uh, you won't be able to thicken it readily. If you've got other materials, particularly metalliferous tailings, which are not clay dominant, but more a rock flower, you will be able to get thickened tailings. You could probably get to paste as well. And you can probably also filter so clay, mineral, clay mineralogy, or the presence of clay minerals, is, is a key in determining just how readily you can dewater your tailings. I've got a division there between pumpable and non-pumpable. Uh, everyone wants to be able to pump their tailings. It's the cheapest way of delivering them. We also want to pump them with cheap and reliable, uh, robust centrifugal pumps. We don't want to have to go to diaphragm pumps or piston pumps, the sort of things you'd use for concrete. They're problematic. Uh, they're expensive, they break down. They're very sensitive to the material inputs. Now, I, I think there's a bit of a, a leap here, and I'm going to indicate that. Where, where you've got, uh, where you can deliver paste tailings by gravity, so you're going to go underground or in a pit, I think paste has a place, and it's particularly used as cemented backfill in underground mining. It could be used as a disposal method for in pit, but you, you need to, to make it economic, you need to be able to deliver it by gravity, not the use, not the need to use, um, you know, piston pumps or positive displacement pumps. So I think if you, if you can't get much beyond thickened, I think you then make the leap. If you're going to make an advance, you make the leap and go to filtration for surface disposal anyway. 
just uh, showing you a bit of an idea of the consistency of tailings going from uh, high density slurry through to a low slump paste, the, the top three diagrams. Uh, the concrete cone test is not, not the ideal test, but it, it's, a, it's a very visual one. It gives you an idea of the consistency of the tailings. The bottom two are centrifuged or wet cake versus filtered or dry cake. And, and there is quite a difference. You can see the, the centrifuge cake is coming, in this case, is coming off a conveyor, but it then flows. The dry cake, the filtered cake, won't flow. It'll come out blocky. So you can transport the filtered cake by conveyor or truck, and when you deposit it, it won't flow the way the centrifuge cake might. The moisture content of those two might be similar. <coughs> centrifuge cake versus filtered cake might be a similar moisture content, but the consistency is very different, and the reason is structure. So the filtered cake involves putting on quite a high stress for a relatively short period of time, and the material remembers the stress. It develops a, a structure, it holds itself together, it won't flow, but the centrifuge one will. So it's quite a difference. You need to understand the processes that tailing slurry goes through when they're deposited, in, the, in particularly in, into a, um, uh, an impit, uh, sorry, a, a surface tailings facility. So they undergo beaching. Beaching is best assessed in the field. In other words, the beaching angle is best assessed in the field. We can do flume testing, but they'll tend to overpredict the slope because the flume is fairly short. So it's an immature beach. It's not a very long one. So the, the beach is steeper. They'll undergo hydraulic sorting. That's best assessed in the field as well. You can't really do it any other way. They'll sort according to their particle size, but they'll also sort according to their specific gravity. So if you look at coal tailings, for example, you'll get, uh, you'll get a bit of a split between the heavier um, particles dropping out first and some coarse particles dropping out first, but some of the larger coal particles, coal-rich coal particles, will actually go further down the beach. So you get some reverse sorting. Uh, coal-rich down the bottom end, end of the beach and sometimes coarser, and non-coal dropping out at the top end of the beach. Um, of course, we don't like to think of uh, coal tailings having a, a coal content, so we tend to call it carbonaceous shale rather than coal. But we're actually shoving coal into the... The worst example I found of that was in uh, Mozambique, where the, the richest deposit they had was the tailings, because they, uh, their, uh, coking, they had a coking coal fraction, they had a steaming coal fraction. The coking coal, um, because of the way they, they handled it, broke down more than the other. Uh, missed the, bypassed the, uh, the wash plant, ended up in the tailings. So their, their coal was about, sorry, their tailings were about 90% coal, but they were too fine to recover them. Uh, settling, uh, very large strain, little shear strength. So it changes in volume a lot, but not much shear strength. It's still a slurry. Consolidation, large strain and a large shear strength gain if you allow full consolidation to occur. Desiccation on exposure to the sun and the wind, you'll get uh, minor strain, in other words, minor further desiccation, uh, densification, but you'll get significant shear strength gain. That's the crusting that, that people talk about. And uh, then lastly, loading. So it could be loading by an upstream raise, it could be loading by a cover. Uh, you could cause bow wave failure, particularly if you've got a thin crust and uh, you, you load too quickly, um, too much too quickly, and you cause a a remolding through that crust. Uh, best loaded progressively on a broad front to avoid that, that sort of bow wave failure. And it will result in a shear strength gain with time because you've loaded up the tailings, they'll dissipate this excess pore pressure, they'll go up in strength. And just to highlight here, settling and consolidation is not well captured in conventional settling column and consolidation testing. In other words, the soil mechanics tests that are available to test uh, soil-like materials are not very adaptable to testing a slurry-like material. You miss most of the activity, and that's why you, you have to, to use alternative methods. Ongoing tailings dam failures. The average tailings failure rate over the last 100 years is about two per year. It's about two per year. Two orders of magnitude higher than the average rate of failure of water dams. Hardly acceptable. So if the, if the failure rate of tailings dams was the same as water dams, it wouldn't be two per year, it would be 0 0.02 per year, 0 0.02 per year. It wouldn't be in people's consciousness. 
it would ha it would be such a rare event that uh, it would be no more um, common than a water dam failure. The focus in particular in recent years has been on failures that occur in developed countries, so that's Mount Polly in pristine British Columbia in 2014, didn't kill anyone, uh, quite seriously affected about 10 kilometres of creek, then most of the tailings went into two lakes. Uh, they did nothing about the lakes in terms of clean up, most of their attention was devoted to the creek, the 10 kilometres of creek. Uh, Katie, Australia, 2018, about a year ago, and I believe the the report on that's uh, due to come out very shortly, but it's taken almost a year to, to get to that point. The other ones are those that involve global mining companies. So Samarco, which was a BHP Vale uh, consortium or joint ownership in 2015, and then just uh, three or so years later, the uh, Bramunda, <laughs> now I'm not, I'm not Portuguese, so I can't pronounce that, the Vale failure in Brazil in 2019. So those recent high profile tailings dam failures are threatening the mining industry's financial as well as social and social licenses to operate. And they're threatening the industry's control of its own destiny. So for example, in 1965, there was a major earthquake in, in Chile, it was about uh, magnitude eight. And that caused uh, the regulator to stipulate that there, there shall be no more upstream raising. So they ruled that from then on, and they, they use cyclone sand dams from then on, they could have centerline racing, provided they flattened off the, up the, the downstream slope to one in four and compacted it. Well, they, they flatten it with dozers and that's tantamount to compacting. And they have to seal the upstream face to try and reduce the amount of water that comes through the dam. So effectively, they're making that sand dam a lot wider and a lot more stable. Um, almost certainly, the Brazilian regulators will outlaw upstream construction in Brazil. Um, they pretty much said they'll do that already. They haven't done it yet. Things in Brazil take a little while. Um, just out of interest, you might, uh, I heard that comment about the response to the Cadia failure, that uh, there's a little bit of confusion as to how to handle that. In Brazil, I'll tell you how it happened. They've had quite a bit of experience in tailing exam failures. So I'll tell you how the, the most recent one worked out or panned out. Um, immediately, the police and military took over the site. The valet workers were shuffled off the site Vale has, had, has actually done nothing at the site since the failure. They've not been allowed to do anything at the site since the failure. Uh, the police arrested people. So their, their process of, uh, they arrested some of the Vale workers and, and others. Their process for um, getting information is to arrest people first, to question them, but keep them under arrest until they finish questioning them. Uh, even when they don't charge them, they still sometimes keep them under arrest. So there are still a number of people still under arrest in jail having been questioned or interrogated, whatever, the, whatever it is they do, uh, but not formally charged with anything. So a very different system to here. Um, none of the, the workers at that site, that Valet site, have returned to work. They're, they're not allowed on site. They're being paid still by Valet, but they haven't returned to site. The, um, the police left the site. There's still a few military, two or three months later, still a few military on site. The fire brigade was brought in to recover bodies, and they're still there, still doing that. And there are also quite a number of volunteers. So that's their response uh, on site. Valet's paying for it all, and there's been a lot of earthworks done to uh, clean up and also recover bodies. Um, but Valet's paying for all that, but they're actually not doing any of that work. They're totally banned from the site. So quite a different approach to what might happen here. Now let's look at some of the guidelines and standards. Um, operation to post-closure. And post-closure for mined facilities is in perpetuity, in perpetuity. What do you think this, this building is designed for? What design life? 50 years? 25? 50? Probably 50. Um, mine facilities are to be closed for in, in perpetuity design. So looking at the, the ANCOL guidelines, one of the biggest changes between 1999 and 2012 was to uh, enact this in perpetuity. So in perpetuity essentially means you move to a one in 10,000 year event. Your operation might have been one in a hundred or one in a thousand. You move one to two orders of magnitude longer in terms of return interval. Australia has 200 years of earthquake data, less than 200 years of earthquake data, and it's of low seismicity, so we don't have a lot of data. We're required to extrapolate that to one in 10,000, from less than 200 years to one in 10,000 with very little data. 
Um, a one in 10,000 for Australia might be equivalent to about a one in 100 for San Francisco, maybe. You wonder whether they actually design in perpetuity for seismic events. Not really, they have damage every time they have an earthquake. We're waiting for the next big one. A dam designed for an operational uh, annual exceedance probability of one in 100 or one in 1,000 may be difficult and expensive to retrofit for one in 10,000. So you can't always just flatten off the slope to make it more stable to cope with a, a tenfold increase in the return interval. Essentially, you've got to design it for the probable maximum flood, which will probably never occur, but it's equivalent to about one in 10,000. Well, we take it as about one in 10,000. It's a major event. Uh, if, you, if you design your tailings dam for closure without putting in a spillway, or because you can't put in a spillway, how could you possibly accommodate a probable maximum event. The response to this Marco or, or Fundau failure from ICMM was to commission Golda to do a re review of tailings management guidelines um, in December, which they came out with in December 2016. There are a couple of links there, and I'm quite happy to make this presentation available to, to people. Um, it doesn't say much. Um, like here, they didn't, uh, didn't look at individual, well, they did look at individual sites, they collected an enormous amount of data, but they did not report them. They reported only very general findings, which were, some corporate documents were found to be comprehensive with examples of good practice. The majority of their member companies have corporate documents that substantially follow good practice. A minority uh, have either uh, documents or, or adopt a surrogate that partly follows good practice. Hence, most member com companies either conform or partly conform to good practice. That's a little bit of gobbledygook, really. It doesn't say much at all, does it? ICMM is, is engaged again. They've got all the CEOs of their member companies, which include all the major mining companies. And, and they, they are talking about perhaps having a, a global review committee uh, to oversee the safety of tailing stands. Um, we have a lot of peer review committees already. So how would this, how would this solve the problem? They did make some recommendations. They said that uh, TSF classification based on consequences of, of failure should be the, the norm. We need a formal change management process, and that came up in uh, a bit of commentary before. We need a few formal communication between the engineer of record or design engineer and the operators and the owners to transfer, transfer and confirm shared understanding of intent. I think this is important and the constraints that TSF design and operation operates under. They need to undertake a formal risk assessment for TSF by suitably qualified people. That's come up also. And there needs to be some form of independent review by suitably qualified and experienced professionals. So they're, they're all sound recommendations and they echo some of the ones that we heard before. So we're all on the same page. The tailings management handbook that came out in 2016 was split up into the, the different sections you can see there. Based on enduring value, life of mine, risk-based approach, and split up into plan, design, construct, operate, monitor and modify, decommission, rehabilitate and close, aftercare and monitor. And looking at uh, leading on to alternative tailing storage and disposal methodologies. So I'll leave you to, there's a link there, I'm quite happy to make that available, but you can easily find this if you just uh, Google tailings management handbook, handbook, you'll find that. So good tailings management. Divert clean runoff around the TSF. You don't want to uh, muddy the waters if you don't have to. Discharge the tailings as thick as you can effectively manage them. At least do that. Discharge them as thick as you can, as you can effectively manage them, which means if you're going to stick with uh, centrifugal pumps, discharge at the thickest consistency you can using that technique. Spigot the tailings in thin layers and cycle the deposition. Maintain a small decant pond, which is possible in most of Australia, except when we get high rainfall. Separate the evaporation or tailings water, uh, have separate, sorry, have separate evaporation or tailings water storage ponds. So don't use your tailing storage as a storage for excess water because you can't dis discharge water from your site. Have a separate water storage for that purpose. Um, however, potentially acid forming, or PAF, 
uh, tailings or otherwise contaminating tailings would benefit from being kept underwater. Maybe they should go in pit. Move towards tailings minimisation, move towards dewatering, and move towards integrated disposal with waste rock. The materials come out, you know, they start out together. We separate them according to particle size and mineralogy. You know, the ore produces the commodity and we get two waste streams, the waste rock and we get the tailings waste stream and sometimes processing waste as well. And we typically handle them or manage them separately. There's no reason why they couldn't be more combined. They go back to a better engineering mix in terms of uh, particle size and so on. So here's a couple of examples, um, spigoting and maintaining a very small decant pond. These are in Western Australia where it's fairly easy to do. <laughs> that's, that's it for now. So I'd welcome any questions at this stage and uh, I'll leave the organisers to dictate the timing. Okay, everybody, this is a good opportunity to ask David some questions. So if anyone would like to raise, it, raise their hand and ask a question, now's a perfect opportunity. Uh, David, my name's Michael. I'm wondering if you could comment on permeability versus safety in tailings dams long term. Say if tailings dams aren't very permeable, how that affects safety. You're talking about the, the tailings dam permeability or the tailings permeability? Um, the, the actual, the tailings. The tailings themselves. Yeah, and yeah, okay. or, and the, I guess the tailings and the tailings dam, yeah. so where the, yeah. where the water goes over time. Yeah, I'll start there by saying um, the most recent, fa the current failure in, in Brazil was of a dam that had been decommissioned in the middle of 2015. Mm -hmm. Now, most people would think, and I'm included in that, that a tailings dam would become more stable with time. You would expect it to become more, more stable with time. Through uh, desiccation of the surface, revegetation of the surface, which happened naturally in Brazil, high rainfall, and through uh, general drain down of the tailings. That, that's clearly not the case in Brazil. So it's a bit of a wake-up call that a decommissioned dam could fail. Now, that dam has no spillway, so it has to handle ongoing uh, rainfall runoff. It also has a spring upstream of it, though I think it's common knowledge that I'm not giving away any secrets in this. So, um, so these, those things need to be taken into account. Now, if it were to drain down, if it becomes unsaturated, actually the permeability becomes much, much lower if it becomes unsaturated. Um, if it uh, consolidates, it'll become less permeable as well. The tailings themselves will become less permeable. Uh, so you would expect that uh, naturally the seepage rates would reduce over time. You would expect that. If it's constantly being re-wet re by rainfall runoff, maybe that's not the case. But generally in Australia, for most of Australia, apart from the wet tropics in the north and Tasmania in the south, you'd expect that to, to be the case. They would become less permeable, seepage rates would go down. The next question is, would the contaminant levels uh, reduce? Um, I suspect they would. But we don't have a lot of evidence for that. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Sort of. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, the Valet failure uh, undertook a liquefaction assessment uh, in 2011 on a, pu this a published paper you can get on the web. Uh, how does that actually compare to the current liquefaction uh, mm -hmm. assessments? Like, like Australia, Brazil is not a, an area of high seismicity. Uh, whereas Chile is, for example. So if you, uh, if you take into account the higher seismic loading that you get in Chile, um, which could result in li liquefaction potential, um, it's likely that your, your dams will be relatively stable under any trigger for liquefaction. So there's this confusion between um, what I'll call earthquake-induced liquefaction and non-earthquake-induced liquefaction. Some people call it static liquefaction. It's a really bad term because you've got static and dynamic in the one phrase. Uh, but static liquefaction is, most people take it to be non-earthquake-induced liquefaction. The condition, the state of the tailings that makes it um, susceptible to liquefaction is the same in both cases. The difference is the trigger. So the trigger in the case of earthquakes is obvious, seismic shaking. In relation to static liquefaction, it's uh, a number of things. It could be uh, too rapid a, a dam construction, so you've induced high pore pressures. It could be a flooding event. It could be too rapid a rate of tailings rise. 
uh, they're all possible. But you need the, the tailings to be in a state that they could liquefy. Most tailings are. Most tailings are near saturated, they're sandy, pine sandy sized, they're loose in most cases. So they're usually susceptible. Um, as to whether the techniques for processing liquefaction have improved over time, uh, yes, they have, but I'll give you a simple example. If you were to try and sample in situ, you know, in the tailings facility, uh, tailings that are likely to or susceptible to liquefaction, you would struggle to get a sample because they'd liquefy in the sampling process. They'd just pour out of the tube. So that, in a way, that's proof that they're potentially liquefiable. Uh, if you're able to get a sample, then they're probably not going to liquefy. And you could do a test in, in the lab and, and demonstrate they won't liquefy. So what we often do is we'll take a, like a bag sample or grab sample and we'll reconstitute them in the lab and do simulated simple shear type testing, cyclic testing and, and whatever. But the trouble is we, don't, we can't relate it to the in situ density. We don't know the state in situ. So I think it's still a work in progress the assessment of static liquefaction. I know what's been happening in Australia, across Australia over the last, I would say, several years, is that we're increasingly getting peer reviews of tailings facilities from people from regimes where seismic activity or, or liquefaction is more likely. Um, and the obvious uh, places are people out of Canada, for example, especially the, the Vancouver region. Um, so that will raise the spectre of, uh, have you considered and they'll probably use the term static liquefaction. Now, they won't say you must, but having raised it, you're obliged to. You have to start assessing it. And uh, there aren't too many, well, I'll tell you, there are two simple shear devices in Australia at the moment, one in Perth and we have one at UQ, we've, which we've only just uh, got and we, we haven't used it yet. So the only one set up to do it is actually the Golder one in Perth, Perth office. Uh, that's, that's lab assessment of liquefaction. And uh, I know that not all consultants are up to speed on how to assess static liquefaction. But increasingly, operators are being asked the question, have you considered static liquefaction? So it's, it's there. You're going to have to do it. One of the last slides you had up was of um, getting the water out of the decamp pond as a benefit. Um, I guess I'm dealing with a situation where there a couple of tailings facilities that are leaking, and I've always had concern about that that was the source of the leak and should be investigated. What, what are the benefits you see of getting, rather than have a decamp pond that pumps back to the process, but getting that water out mm. totally? Yeah. Uh, if you're talking about physical stability, then it's better to have the water off. If you're talking about chemical stability, then it's better to have it covered by water. So you've got that conundrum. Um, so you may, you know, there are, if you look at cases like the wet tropics, where it's difficult to keep the water off anyway, uh, often they'll, they'll actually use that. They'll use their tailings facility to put all their hot stuff, all their PATH material, both waste rock and tailings, and it'll be kept underwater in perpetuity. But you've then got to, you've then got to in perpetuity, guarantee that that structure is stable. And operationally, it's only a one in 100 year or one in 1,000 year uh, event you have to design for. So, um, you're going to have to spend a lot of money later to make that stable in perpetuity. So the approach in Canada, for example, with potentially acid forming tailings was to uh, ultimately put them under water, but they didn't always design that in during the operation. So they had to retrofit it. Sometimes they'd retrofit it by, because you get a tailings uh, beach, you get a slope, which might've been exposed for a period of time during operation. And to put that all under water with, just the one dam, you'd have to raise the dam to about twice its height. It'd have to be a massive structure. So what they typically did was a series of dams and a series of terraces. So they actually built dams on top of the tailings. They never designed to carry a dam. They might've been underwater for quite a bit of their, their life. So you've now got the potential instability of those dams built on tailings because they're supposed to be stable in perpetuity. So there's, there's concern now in Canada that, uh, okay, they might have come up with a good way of keeping the, the tailings inert by keeping them underwater, but they've done it with a, a, a structure that may not survive in perpetuity. Mm. And if those dams fail, then uh, not only will you expose the acid forming material, but you might inundate populations downstream. So big problem. Um, I mean, you can go to, if you plan it from the outset, 
so that you and let's let's say you're looking more to a, a more integrated uh, waste disposal facility, even if you keep the, the tailings separate, build a massive dam. Mm. Build a dam that uh, is actually your waste rock dump and make sure that you've got a component of that dam which is actually your seal to, uh, to keep the, the water upstream of you, but have a massive structure so that physically it's stable in perpetuity. It's a waste rock dump, basically. Yeah, well, I guess in this case it's like when the thing started, the tailings dam was down here at the decamp dam, and as it's progressively been lifted through its further up slope... Yes. ..and that where the dam water level is in the decamp, the whole tailings are saturated yeah. on that level. Would, if right from the commencement you made a point of getting water out of the decant and never yes. having water there, because the, yeah. the tailing slurry is really there to settle the solids. That's the, I guess, the purpose of the beach: dirty water in, mm. get the clean water back in the process. If it's done that job of creating the beach, if you get the water out, are you yeah. going to get rid of your water problem? Yeah, throughout? but can, uh, your your maximum uh, densification is not from consolidation. So, to give you an example, um, red mud uh, settles to about. Well, it depends which facility you're talking about. There are two in, in Gladstone. The worst is about 0.5 dry tonnes per cubic metre. That's the settled density underwater, essentially underwater. 0.5 dry tonnes per cubic metre. The SG of that material is three. So you're actually storing mainly water. 85% of the volume at 0.5 dry tonnes per cubic metre is water. So you're actually storing water. Uh, so it's essentially a, a water dam or a watery dam, if you like, a very uh, dilute slurry. Um, if they want to, you can increase that, that dry density to about 1.5, so half the SG, so it's half solids by mass. Uh, but you, you have to do it by amphi-rolling and then compacting using swamp dozers. They've got to put a lot of energy into to doing it. You could potentially also look at uh, dewatering before you put it out there. Uh, they don't do that. Uh, they choose to, to put the effort in afterwards. Um, so the difference between, that's a threefold difference in dry density. And at 1.5, it's about, it's still about 50% um, water. So the volume you're taking up is enormous. Um, and you've got essentially a slurry behind a damn wall. So, um, you know, consolidation alone is not enough to, to drive the water out. You've, you've got to desiccate as well. And a lot of tailings hang on to water. Red muds hang on to water. They don't like settling. Clay-rich uh, coal tailings don't settle well either. Um, I mean, uh, it's common experience that your tailings dam always fills quicker than you expect. Doesn't it? It always fills quicker than you expect. So clearly you're not achieving the density that you might have assumed you would get. And part of the reason for that is it's too small. So you, you can't cycle it in thin lifts. You can't rely on desiccation. But I, I take your point. If, if uh, the geochemistry is the key issue or the key driver, keep it underwater in perpetuity if you want closure. Put it in a pit. Just a couple of things I picked up from the earlier presentations. I'll try and uh, summarise a couple of them. Uh, residual risk was a, a point brought up. That's um, it's also become very popular parlance in Queensland, and there's a, there's a publication out on residual risk. So if you, if you look up uh, DES, and I'm sure you've got it anyway, but for the, other, the, the others in the audience, look up un, under DES, which is now the name for the Department of Environment and Science, as they're now called. They keep changing their name about once every election. Um, they've got a, a publication. I think it's possibly still draft, but I think the comments period is, is finished. Anyway, they talk about residual risk. Now, one of the points I'd make about that, because I've had meetings with them, is it's not just about meeting the environmental mm -hmm. conditions. So environmental conditions are imposed on operations, you know, before you start the operation. I would say partly or largely because the industry is not trusted to meet those environmental conditions. They have to be imposed. They have to be you know, put in, in black and white. But environmental conditions are not always conducive to closure. So a couple of examples which are not conducive to, to closure. If your envi environmental condition is no discharge, that's not conducive to closure. You, you, have to have, you have to have discharge on closure. 
when we get a major flooding event in Queensland, we have discharge anyway. We had no control over it. So in perpetuity, you're going to have discharge. So you've got to have a, a scheme that's going to accommodate that. The other thing is to collect sediment in sediment ponds. That's not a closure. Um, that's not something you could satisfy in perpetuity enclosure because they have to be maintained. You have to dig them out. So, you know, environmental conditions are not conducive to closure. They're, they're a different thing. And I think the document in Queensland is, is too focused on you'll address residual risk if you, if you address your environmental conditions. You will simply leave the tailings and they'll dry out. They don't. <laughs> so what happens when you leave tailings, if you've built them up, this is particularly so in pit because the rate of rise is quite high. Let's say you, you fill your pit, uh, you've got residual water over the top, you take the water away, you think the tailings will dry out. All that happens is you get a very thin crust on the surface and the crust serves to stop any further dewatering vertically upwards. It'll close it off. It'll crust over and it'll close it off. And the crust will be quite thin. So it might be, it would be no more than a few hundred mil. And you might be able to walk on it quite safely. Um, I doubt you'd even get a, a D6 swamp dozer over it. So that's not a solution. And once that crust is formed, no further, virtually no further water comes out. Um, probably 75% on average of the, the dewatering of tailings is upwards. Initially, there might be some into the foundation or through the wall, but typically the majority goes upwards. If you've got a crust on the top, it can't do that. So it closes off. The question of uh, trying to estimate the, how much consolidation will you get in the long term for tailings? Uh, we have no good evidence for what that might be. Uh, we've got a couple of sites that are now doing it, like ERA, for example, is putting tailings in pit and they're, they're monitoring. Uh, my guess is that um, quite a lot of that cons consolidation will never occur. It'll essentially be like a tank. You'll have a, a surface layer which is effectively sealing off what's below and it'll be like a water body, body or a fluid body that simply takes the load like a fluid pressure and it, it won't consolidate. So estimates of you know, enormous amounts of consolidation settlement, they're not right, they won't happen. It'll just sit there. It'll move a bit, very slowly. It's almost geological time. Thank you.